out here on the West Coast like I am. Uh, this is Mike Geringer, Director of Knowledge Management at Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. And uh, we're really happy that you all could join us today to hear a little bit more about uh, this new product, this new publication that we just came out with a few weeks ago uh, that are the kind of the main findings and final results from our 2016 national program survey. So we're going to walk you all through today kind of what we found. Um, I have my co-author, Sam McQuillan, uh, is also joining me on the webinar today, and uh, we look forward to uh, answering any questions you have about the report and, and really just explaining what we found. Uh, this was the probably the biggest snapshot of mentoring programs in, in a good decade or two, and so uh, we're just very excited to kind of share what we found and, and uh, answer answer questions that you may have from the report. I will note before we get started, the report, if you don't have it, is available on the Mentor website in the Program Resources section. Uh, there should be a tab in there that says National Survey, and if you go there, you should be able to, to download the report. And if you downloaded it right when it came out, you may want to download it again. Uh, as sometimes happens on these, we actually found an error in <laughs> the first PDF version of it. There was a table uh, that broke down the ages of use served by programs. So that has been fixed. So um, you may want to uh, get a fresh copy of it. Uh, it's a free PDF to download. So um, before we get uh, started here and really dive into the presentation, just some housekeeping things. Um, and I, I think right off the bat, I would like to really thank uh, so many groups and individuals that contributed to the report Sam and I will be discussing today. Um, and really, I want to start off by <clears throat> thanking many of you on this call, the programs and the practitioners, the staff members out there that completed this survey. We literally would not have a product without you taking the time to kind of share um, some thoughts about your program, um, and especially our national organization partners that distributed this opportunity and a link to the survey to all of their affiliates around the country, um, to Mentor's own affiliates. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the working group of, of representatives from uh, Mentor's uh, partnerships around the country um, that certainly uh, encourage programs to fill it out. Um, I have to thank Altria uh, for their very generous support of the project. Uh, they were wonderful partners in this and actually allowed us to provide a little bit of a, an incentive, a little uh, cash prize, if, if you will, um, to folks that filled out the survey by the deadline. And I know many mentoring programs probably uh, paid for some really fun events for their young people or, or bought much needed supplies um, with that. So big thanks to them for all of their generous support um, on this project and others. And then personally, I got to thank Sam um, and uh, his colleague, Heather McDaniel at the University of South Carolina, uh, just tremendous research partners in this work, uh, working with Mentor um, on this effort. So big thanks to all of those folks. Um, housekeeping, uh, all phones are muted here. Um, it looks like we've got about 60 or so folks on the line today. Uh, probably have more folks joining as we, we go through this. Um, we're going to keep those phones muted for best audio quality here, but you can still ask questions um, about the report or about the work that Sam and I did here um, using the question panel on the, uh, on the side of the screen here. Um, and I forgot to mention, we have Jennifer Burgoyne from Mentors Boston office who will be handling Q&A today as well. We always get asked as these webinars kind of go on, will a recording of this be made available? Uh, can I get a copy of the slides? And the answer to both of those questions is yes. Um, we are recording this webinar and, uh, and we'll certainly be making a PDF version of these slides available. Um, we can probably, Jen, email that out to folks after the event or or at the very least have those posted on Mentor's website early next week, and we'll, we'll uh, make sure everyone who attended today um, gets the message around that. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, really, I think I would like to explain to everybody kind of why Mentor um, decided to, to do this big national survey, and Sam and I will talk a little bit about the methodology and the approach that we took when putting the uh, survey together and then analyzing the results. Um, and certainly our, our main uh, order of business here is to 
really walk everybody through the major findings from the report and what we learned um, and some kind of interesting shifts over time for the mentoring field, um, but really just exploring kind of the nuances of, of the data itself. Um, we'll also then talk a little bit at the end about some kind of macro level conclusions that Sam and, and I felt uh, kind of emerged from this work. We will have multiple points in, in the presentation here for Q&A. So about uh, halfway through, we'll pause and, and see if folks have questions. And then at the end, I'm hoping to leave a generous amount of time for Q&A. So I wanna start off by talking a little bit about why Mentor uh, decided to take really what wound up being almost two years to plan and implement and then uh, report on this kind of large survey of the mentoring field. And I think when I, I think about mentors work, you know, we do so much on behalf of programs and in service of, of programs, uh, both in terms of, you know, helping them improve their quality, driving volunteers nationally to their doors to volunteer to help a child, um, you know, encouraging funders in both the public and private sector to get involved and to, to support this work. And we really view that as, as work as a servant leader for the field. Uh, but to do that well, we kind of need to know who we are serving and have a better understanding of kind of the needs, the challenges, the successes, um, and the nuances of service delivery of programs around the country. Uh, we also had an internal goal of kind of coordinating the data that was being collected already by our state and region level affiliates. Uh, they were kind of already collecting a lot of this program data on an annual or biannual basis, but uh, we weren't doing that in as coordinated a way as we, we would have liked and, and wanted to be able to roll up some numbers and, and tell a bit of a national story. Um, I think, you know, we also wanted to see what's happening within, you know, the quote unquote industry of, of mentoring and uh, what are trends that we see perhaps over time in comparison to, to other studies, opportunities to grow this work. Um, and then Sam, I think you had a motivation here around kind of better understanding, you know, kind of the, the models of mentoring, or if you want to say a few words about that. Right. So I think one of the things that I was interested in was just to see how mentoring as a field is changing in terms of how we actually develop, deploy programs and how we're serving youth in different ways, particularly around uh, the length of matches and whether or not we're using some type of curriculum or specific program model uh, to serve children. Great. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, so I, it was not hard to recruit a, a researcher to help support this work because uh, almost every researcher I, I interface with is constantly asking me questions about uh, kind of what programs look like and who's doing what in the field. So Sam uh, certainly was, was eager to dive in around that type of stuff. So in developing this survey, uh, we did a couple of things. One is we went back and reviewed kind of previous efforts to do a similar thing. And, and that included going back to some of the early work that public-private ventures did um, around the turn of the century here. Um, so work by Sindo, um, some of that had been commissioned by Mentor, some of it was just research PPV was doing uh, on their own to kind of create a typology of mentoring programs uh, for a field that at the time was very much emerging and very much uh, kind of just starting to grow into the, the very robust field that we see today. Uh, we then worked with a, a working group of uh, affiliates, um, of mentor affiliates, so representatives from about eight or nine of our, our state level partners. Um, and there's a list of, of who they were in the, the full report. And we spent a long time, I'm talking probably half a year, <laughs> trying to get agreement on what exactly the questions were and how we were going to ask them and, and you know, how many questions we could ask and, and, you know, trying to keep an eye on both, you know, depth of information, but also making a survey that was not nine hours to complete. So uh, a lot of good time and effort went into that. Uh, we then built out the survey in the platform that we used, to tested it to make sure it was working as intended, and then really rolled it out uh, to the mentoring field through our affiliates, through our national partners, 
Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we had a little bit of a, a small incentive just to whet the appetite of folks who might fill it out. Um, and certainly, I, you know, that was a, a nice aspect of the project um, from our, our funder and um, I think enabled us to get a slice of programs that we may not have otherwise. We actually wound up getting quite a few smaller and what I would consider to be very grassroots programs uh, to fill it out. And, and I think some of that incentive was, was responsible for that. The data collection for this, I want to be clear about this piece of it. It ran over quite a period of time because our affiliates tended to want to collect this information at certain times of the year. But for the most part, programs filled this out in kind of the late spring and over the summer. Uh, there were a few states that kind of bled into the early fall, um, but all of the data collection was done by, by October of last year. And because programs were filling it out at kind of different points in the year, we asked them to report on their last full year of services. So if it was a program that was cyclical in nature and took a break for part of the year, say a school-based program, we asked them to report on the last full year of their services. For community-based programs that are kind of running year-round, they just reported on their last 12 months. And so uh, the data that's in the, the report is not from a particular time period beyond this. Um, it's kind of a merging of different programs last years, so to speak, but we felt that having everyone just talk about what did you do in the last 12 months in your program was probably the best approach uh, given the, the timeline that we had. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did outreach on, on multiple levels and through multiple channels to try and reach as many programs as possible. We also spent a lot of time uh, after the fact uh, doing data analysis and cleaning. And Sam, I'm going to ask you to kind of talk a little bit more about the work that you and Heather did um, once we have the data in hand. Right. So as Mike was saying, this is a pretty big project in terms of scope. And with the survey, one of the things we wanted to make sure that we did was provide the respondents enough opportunity to provide uh, answers that didn't directly go into one of our preordained categories. So, for example, if they were selecting what type of program they had, we'd also give them the opportunity to select uh, other and then put in something. So, with that, some of those we had to actually recode. So, if somebody, you know, did not select group-based mentoring, but then wrote in that our mentors meet with children in groups, then we would go through manually and recode those. There's also some data that was uh, obviously erroneous. Uh, in terms where they would have uh, numbers that were nonsensical that we had to go through uh, and remove. And if we did find outliers that uh, were statistical outliers, uh, but that we believe to be legitimate answers, we also had to navigate how we report those to make sure that our uh, estimates, you know, our averages and other uh, graphs and such weren't skewed because of those outliers. So we put some narrative into the report and uh, Mike and I today will be talking about how we handled some of those, particularly around uh, money questions and then also youth served and youth per staff and some of those. Yeah. Um, there's also circumstances where like missing values. So if we have a, you know, a total number of youth that are being served in the surveys, but then we're missing some information on uh, some of our programs that would change our denominator and there's just some stuff that we had to go through to figure out how we want to report that. So that's, again, a pretty long process, like Mike said. Yeah, we talk about this quite a bit in the full report. So if folks have more, uh, want to learn more, a little bit more about some of those procedures. Um, but you're right, Sam. I mean, a lot of that was around the budget questions that we asked where we knew that we didn't want to be putting out an inaccurate um, estimate or an inaccurate average. And we certainly had a few outliers that we had to throw out. I believe there was one program that said they had a $1 million budget and served two youth. So either those are the most mentored youth in our, in our field or that was a, a, a typo that uh, we, we had to kind of address. So lots of stuff like that in the analysis work. And in the end, uh, all of that work resulted in uh, the data set that you see in the, the report. And 
Uh, we got completed surveys from almost 1,300 unique agencies. So we considered agencies to be the, the organization that runs a program or perhaps multiple programs. Uh, they could report on more than one program if they happen to run um, several. Uh, so say they do a group school-based program and a community-based one-to-one, they were able to report on those separately, and we thought that was an important aspect of this survey. So uh, a little over 1,400 uh, unique programs were analyzed, and those programs were serving over 400,000 kids with just about 200,000 mentors. So a pretty big uh, slice of the young people and volunteers um, that, that do the work in this field. And we got a lot of detailed information about their services, the settings they do the work in, their staffing, funding, challenges, and so forth. And that's what Sam and I are going to be really walking you through on the, the remainder of the call here today. Um, and in the end, Sam, I would say, you know, it's unknown what percentage of the mentoring field in terms of number of programs that are out there that filled this out. Um, but I do think that this is probably the largest um, amount of information collected to date about mentoring programs, um, both in terms of the number of programs. One of those PPV studies may have eclipsed us in terms of number of programs by just a little bit, but I certainly think the volume of questions that we were asking makes this probably the most robust data set, and, and Sam and I hope a fairly representative one. We have a lot of large agencies, a lot of small agencies, and and everything in between. So um, the data that we're going to talk about and share with you today, you know, take it with a bit of a grain of salt. We are not quite sure how representative it is of of the entirety of the field, but we think it's it's a pretty good slice and, and says a lot about our work in the mentoring space. So let's take a quick look at those organizations that are providing mentoring programs, those agencies that may run one or, or multiple programs. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, the vast majority of, of them were nonprofits uh, that were doing this work. Uh, we had a lot of urban and metropolitan uh, agencies fill out this survey, and some of that just has to do with where Mentor uh, has its affiliates. I believe about 85% of the respondents to this survey were from states where Mentor has an affiliate working with programs on the ground. So we did not get quite the, the penetration that we wanted into states like Wisconsin or Arizona, uh, where I know there's a lot of good mentoring work happening, uh, but I think we just struggled a little bit to reach those programs uh, to, to fill out the survey. Um, most of programs or most agencies, I should say, only operated one program, so there really wasn't much of a distinction between the agency and, and the program itself. Um, but in the cases where they did offer other services to youth and families, a lot of them did positive youth development, uh, leadership development, service learning, um, a few that offered child care or other, you know, kind of wraparound services for, for youth with a lot of needs. So uh, I wasn't terribly surprised by, by any of that, but it, it was a nice reminder that um, many of the organizations that do mentoring are also doing other things for young people and families. And so... Uh, the hope is, I think, that mentoring is part of a more holistic suite of services and, and good work that goes on on behalf of kids and, and their families. We asked then a number of questions about the agency kind of at that, you know, uh, top level. So not at the specific program level, but overall for your organization. Uh, we asked about a number of things, one of which was the recruitment of mentors. Uh, here we're assuming that they were using volunteers, although we did have a few programs in this survey that were using a paid model. Um, <clears throat> and for the most part, uh, you know, not surprisingly, based on conversations I've had with staff over the years of programs, uh, word of mouth, having current mentors ask uh, friends, family, coworkers, uh, and whatnot to, to join them in mentoring young people was by far the most common strategy that folks said was successful for them. There were others that I was kind of intrigued by. I think, you know, online outreach seemed to be much more important than I would have guessed and certainly more important than it was in some of these previous studies from, you know, 20 years ago where no one was using the Internet for outreach to volunteers. I, I think the other one that I'll just mention here, it's not on the slide, but a lot of programs reported having success uh, with referrals from community partners. 
both organizations that do things other than mentoring, but also from other mentoring programs that perhaps got a volunteer that came in the door that wasn't a good fit for them. Well, I think you're a better fit for this program down the road, and I'll I'll send you that direction. So I, I was heartened by that. I, I thought that was a nice uh, finding around kind of the collaboration uh, that mentoring programs are engaging in in their communities. Um, there were a few strategies for recruitment that were rated fairly low, and I, I think two that actually speak to the work of mentor and, and some things that we need to to shore up a little bit. One was referrals from the Mentoring Connector database. Uh, this is a database uh, for programs where you can have your program listed and volunteers that are looking for a mentoring opportunity in your community can get referred to your program through that system. So if you're not in there, uh, I will encourage Jen Burgoyne to, in the follow-up email, we send all of you guys to let you know how to sign up for the connector if you haven't already. Um, but only 4% of programs said that that was one of their top four recruitment strategies. Um, another 3% said they got referrals from their local mentor affiliate. So um, I think as we do things like National Mentoring Month, we'll just have to put more effort into um, really making sure that the programs can participate in those and that the general public is aware of, of the opportunities that we're trying to provide locally as well. Whoops, skipped ahead there. We also asked about evaluation practices. Um, so as a mentoring organization, what have you done in the last five years around evaluation? And we asked about a bunch of different types of evaluation. Uh, most programs, you know, almost 70% here are doing some kind of qualitative work where I'm guessing they're just, you know, using an end of year satisfaction survey or, or in conversations with program participants, kind of assessing whether folks are liking the experience. Um, you'll see 45% said that they do some form of implementation evaluation. Uh, we didn't ask kind of more details about what that is, but you know, this was described in the, the question as, you know, are you assessing kind of the fidelity to the model and kind of the consistency with which you deliver services? I guess the depressing side of that is that 55% of programs went half a decade without examining that at all, without really taking a, a hard look at whether they're delivering their services as intended and whether participants are getting the experience out of it that uh, they were hoping for. And so I think that's a number that Mentor needs to work with the field to, to try and improve a little bit. Uh, a slightly higher percentage said that they were doing outcome evaluation, but you'll see in the next number down there that 8.5%, only 8% of them said that they did that outcome evaluation using either an experimental or a quasi-experimental design. In other words, something that would have a comparison group or a control group of non-mentored youth so that you could compare your mentored youth to those who didn't get that service. and. So what that tells me is that most programs say they're doing outcome evaluation, but in reality are probably doing what might be better described as outcome monitoring. They're monitoring the changes in their mentored youth over time, but aren't really comparing them to young people that uh, aren't getting that service. And there's a lot of value in doing that. Uh, you kind of need, if you want to claim that it was your program that was responsible for their improvement and change, then, then you need to have something to compare them to. Uh, so that's another area where I think we're going to work with the field to, uh, and not every program is going to be able to do a random control trial. That's unrealistic and would cost a, a gazillion dollars um, that we don't have. But I do think every program can probably improve um, how they're doing that outcome evaluation. And then, you know, kind of most depressingly, I think 14% of programs said that they hadn't engaged in any evaluation activities at all over five years. And um, that's something that, you know, once again, I feel like our field needs to um, stop doing that, <laughs> start putting a little bit more intentionality into uh, evaluating our services. We did ask about challenges too, um, and this really, once again, speaks to mentors' role in trying to help programs and help our field broadly overcome barriers to doing our good work. And unsurprisingly here, the, the highest you know, rated challenges were things related to people and money. So recruiting enough volunteers, 
getting enough funding to run the program, sustain it, grow it over time. Uh, but I've called out a couple of things here on this slide that I think speak to other challenges that in some cases I was surprised uh, the program set. And I believe they could choose up to three or four challenges here. So they, they didn't have to just pick one. Um, but as we just talked about, program evaluation, data collection was rated pretty high. I was surprised at the number of programs that said engaging parents and families is a struggle. And uh, I guess the more I think about that, I mean, this is a common challenge that I've heard folks say, but that percentage seemed a little higher than I might have expected. And then, you know, 22% of programs said that it, they're struggling with developing meaningful activities for mentors and youth. And I think programs are, are desiring to get a little bit more intentional about what they're doing uh, within the match and, and what they're having mentors kind of more purposefully do. We're going to talk about that quite a bit uh, in, in a few slides here. Um, so just some challenges here. We talk about these more in depth in the, the full report. We asked a few questions around kind of uh, things related to the work of, of mentor. So we did ask about familiarity with the elements of effective practice for mentoring. The fourth edition, which you see the cover of here on the slide, had just come out. Uh, so it was, you know, a little bit early to be asking, do you use this new edition? Um, but even then, 45% said they used it regularly or a bit. Um, but about half the field said that they were not using the new edition, and, and a, you know, half of those said, I'm not using any version of the elements of effective practice, which, um, you know, we put this out with the intention that at least some of it, some of the practices recommended will be applicable to just about everybody. Um, but I, I think, you know, my concern about that was tempered a little bit. I went back and looked at some previous studies that had asked that question, and and that usage rate seems to be fairly stable over the last decade or so. So for as long as mentors have been tracking this, about half of you get a lot of value out of the elements. <laughs> about half of you uh, either haven't read it or, or read it and, and are not using it uh, deeply in your work. But there were some uh, benefits when programs did. So Sam and I did some comparison of programs that reported using the elements versus those that did not. And I think, you know, unsurprisingly, the ones that do use the elements to inform what they do kind of demanded a little bit higher level of quality out of their staff and their participants. So they required longer matches and, and more multi-year commitments. They had fewer youth on a wait list. Um, they had some different challenges. Um, it's not that they had no challenges, but they were less likely to report challenges around mentor training, around some of the fundraising and partnership stuff, um, and even just in providing staff development. Uh, they seem to be putting more in emphasis and intentionality into the, the quality, I would say, of the program. Um, and they were more likely, you know, I already mentioned training, but they were far less likely to report that they did no training. I forget the exact number, but there was a shocking number of programs that said we don't train our mentors at all, which uh, you know, really surprised me. Um, but if you follow the elements, you were likely to do a lot of training, uh, often more than three hours of, of pre-match training. So we felt good like that this was some indication that our, our resources are influencing uh, what programs do. We also looked at who gets technical assistance, who gets some help in running or improving their program. And you can see here the percentages of folks that said they got some support from a a mentor affiliate or from our national office or through the National Mentoring Resource Center, which we run on behalf of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Um, there were not a lot of differences between agencies that said we got help from mentor or got help from some other entity like a United Way or a private consultant. Uh, we, Sam and I looked at that quite a bit and, and nothing really stood out. Um, but agencies that we worked with um, did cost a little bit less per youth served. Uh, they were more likely to do some longer training. Uh, unsurprisingly, they were more likely to use the elements in what they do. Um, and the one area where they really differed is they did a lot more evaluation and at a higher level of rigor. Um, so I think when you do work with a technical assistance provider, whether it's somebody associated with us or otherwise, um, they're probably going to push you a little bit to not only make some program improvements, but then track them and evaluate whether 
um, it's actually being effective. So uh, we were kind of heartened to see that. So the last section I'm going to walk through here before we pause for some questions is what mentoring program services really look like um, when you unpack them. Uh, and, you know, I guess one of the things that I will just generally say is that there was very little in this data that surprised me. The field wound up looking pretty much exactly like what I would have expected it to look, to be honest. Um, and, and that's okay. That actually you know, hasn't changed a lot over time in terms of things like program models. Um, the ratio of group programs here was just about what public-private ventures found 20 years ago. Uh, what we do have more of are, these days are blended programs where you're matched perhaps one-on-one -on -one with a mentor, but most of your time in the program is spent as a dyad in group activities, so kind of a blend of group and one-to-one. -one. Um, if you're wondering what the, the ratio was, looking across all of the group mentoring programs that filled this out, this is a question that I get asked a lot. Um, and it was for every one mentor, they were working with about three youth, um, which was a little bit of a smaller ratio than I would have guessed. But there were certainly some programs that were one to 10. There were some programs that were you know, one to two. And, and so when you added all that up, it came out to about that. Um, but I do think it's worth noting that those group and blended programs actually serve more young people than just the peer one-to-one -one programs. So um, while most programs do do a one-to-one -one model, if you just think about how are young people getting their mentoring, they're just as likely to be getting it through a group context uh, than they are just a one-on-one -on -one match. We also looked a little bit at where mentoring is happening in the community, and uh, one of the things I think Sam and I regretted doing was not asking in this question, what's the primary place they meet and then secondary places they meet? Uh, so we just allowed programs to, to note, yes, my, my matches meet in any of these places, not mutually exclusive. So. Most programs said that they did both at some level. So even if you had a fairly site-based program, say at a K-12 school during the school day, many of those programs did say that they got out and did stuff out in the community. Uh, they visited places. They, they went around and, and did things in the real world, so to speak. So I, I think generally we found very few programs that were purely site or community-based but in the full report, we did do a comparison of those. We did compare programs that said they were exclusively site-based to those that were exclusively out in the community. Um, and we also have a section comparing one-on-one -on -one group and blended program models across a whole bunch of different dimensions that I, I won't get into here. But if you're curious to see how those look, um, you know, in general, those site-based programs tend to be more focused on academics, educational things, skill development. The community-based programs tend to be a little bit more focused and one-to-one -one programs tend to be more focused on relational things and um, kind of social, emotional uh, learning and, and kind of personal development. Um, so there's a, a lengthy section describing that in the, the full report. I was kind of surprised at how little online mentoring was happening. I thought that in this day and age, there would be a lot more programs saying our matches meet, at least in part, uh, using you know a website, Facebook, uh, you know electronic messaging of some kind. Um, I would have thought that would have been more more popular, perhaps. We also looked at the frequency, the intensity, the duration of matches, and for the most part, um, this looked very much like what I would have expected. Most matches meet once a week or a couple of times a month. Uh, <clears throat> most of them meet for about, you know, somewhere between, you know, four to 10 hours, somewhere in there uh, in a month. And, you know, by far the most common kind of minimum commitments were a calendar year or a school year. Uh, we do compare this to some of the early PPV data in the, the study. Um, there's a lot more programs requiring a multi-year commitment than there used to be, but for the most part, these types of kind of delivery nuances look very much the way our, our field, I think, has looked for a couple of decades now. And then 
One of the things that was really important to Sam and I was to really look at um, how successful our matches in uh, kind of having their bare minimum expectation men, met. And we looked at a couple of things. We looked at how long does the average match last. Um, and kind of if you look at all the programs in our survey, it came out to about 16 months on average, and that includes you know, matches that have lasted for 10, 15 years and includes matches that, you know, lasted only a few months um, and perhaps even intentionally lasted a short period of time given the program. But uh, I think we were surprised to find that 78% of matches made it to that minimum length. We asked, you know, programs, what percentage of your young people, you know, kind of got to whatever your minimum commitment length was. And I was surprised at that number. Um, it's a little bit higher than I think some historical things. Um, but Sam, I know that that's something that you spend a lot of time crunching the data around. We kind of figure out, had to figure out how to estimate this. And, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about your thoughts around um, kind of what this means for the field and, and how it may compare historically. Right. I think that, you know, the thing to think about with this, and actually Gene Rhodes just recently wrote a blog about some other thing. It was called Not Mentoring Relationships Shouldn't Be a Home Run Derby or something, uh, but it was yep. on her Chronicle of Evidence-Based Mentoring. The basic idea is that if you take like a, you know, a third of the pie from all the mentors, you know, whether or not their match lasts to what they're expecting to last is essentially a coin flip. Uh, and for some of those, it's much less than a coin flip. Uh, and for, uh, you know, some of them, it, it might be a little bit stronger. But I think that for the field, that's a, uh, you know, something we need to think about, not just in terms of how do we increase the likelihood, which is, I think, a good thing to think about, is how do we increase the likelihood that we have matches that persist, but also how do we support matches that might be uh, high risk, and how do we actually, you know, do some good for the children that we're serving within those matches? And I, I was interested in this data, and I, like Mike said, we looked at this in a number of different ways, and those are also in the full report. Yep. Yeah, and I think you know, I was happy to see the percentage of matches that made it to that minimum length. Um, and we, you know, we wrestled a lot with, you know, is this average match length even meaningful, given that. Uh, you're going to have outliers, you know, that that 10 or 15 year match that everyone, you know, thinks of as the ideal is going to skew these numbers considerably. That's going to offset a bunch of failed matches that burned out in six weeks, right? And so I don't put a lot of stock in that average length per match number. Um, I think if we broke it down by program type, it would be a lot more meaningful. To me, what I wanted to really look at, and this is where I think that 78% number comes in, is how many people are getting the mentoring experience that they were promised, a relationship that's going to last a certain amount of time. And, you know, life happens. There will be attrition in programs. Some percentage of matches will just not make it because people move away or something comes up, right? But uh, I wanted to see, you know, can we put a, a benchmark on, you know, how many matches get, you know, at least the time that they were promised uh, to build a relationship together. So I was pretty happy with that number. Right. And one more also, quick caveat. Oh, yeah, on, go, yeah, go ahead. Sam. The one thing to think about with the uh, slides on uh, match length is that this is essentially uh, programs reporting, you know, how they perceive their matches on average. And some of them probably have very detailed records, but others may not. And I think that, you know, when we're considering the data that Mike and I got from the survey, it's also important to kind of compare and contrast that with what we see when we actually observe mentoring relationships. And I know there's been some studies, I think actually in uh, one of David Dubois' recent studies with uh, positive youth development, they looked at match length. And uh, you get some different numbers if you compare who's reporting and how they're reporting. But in general, I think that uh, we had a pretty good idea of what programs were thinking in terms of how their matches uh, persisted or didn't. Yep, and there's definitely some bias in there. I mean, nobody wants to say, uh, you know, my matches are not <laughs> working, but um, 
I guess, uh, just to go back a slide here, you know, there were a pretty healthy uh, percentage of programs here that said, yeah, you know, less than half of my matches or, you know, in the worst case, you know, less than a quarter of my matches made it as long as they were supposed to. Um, I would certainly hope those are programs that are requesting technical assistance through the National Mentoring Resource Center because uh, they may need it. Um, but yes, uh, you know, I, so Tom Keller and Renee Spencer, uh, two researchers, are doing a, a big study of match closures right now, and they found that about 70% of matches in that study were making it to that uh, kind of minimum commitment point. So we're not far off from some of those direct observations, as you noted, Sam, but others have found a higher percentage, so um, a little bit of a grain of salt with that. So we also asked programs kind of what do you do? What are you trying to do for young people? And uh, there's a, a much lengthier chart that kind of details, uh, we asked about you know 15 or 20 different potential outcomes that you've got. Um, and you know, obviously you know, a good half of programs are kind of doing general positive youth development or working on life skills or social skills. Um, but I found it interesting that only 44% and you could pick up to like four goals, right? So it wasn't you had to pick like one goal. You could pick four things that you really emphasize in your program. And even then, only 44% of programs said that providing a young person with that caring adult relationship was an outcome that they pursued. Um, now, some of that could be semantics. Some people could say, well, everyone gets this caring adult relationship, but it's not really an outcome. It's a precursor to the outcome. It's a vehicle to achieve the outcomes. But I think you know, one of the things we talk about in the full report is if you compare this to historical data, some of that early public private ventures literature, 20 years ago, 100% of programs said that their primary objective was to provide a caring adult relationship to the kid. That was it. That was the point of their program was that relationship. And I find it interesting that 20 years later, um, you know, we, we're looking at this as the, re the relationship is perhaps more of a vehicle to achieve some other outcome, uh, that the, it's not in and of itself the outcome that the program is desiring. Now, I had a, a colleague of mine a few weeks ago kind of challenge me on this and say, well, you know, we have better recognition in our field now that young people do come to our programs with strengths and with existing relationships with good people in their lives. And so it could be that perhaps our field is just honoring those natural ties and those natural relationships that all kids do come to our doors with. Um, and maybe that puts less of an emphasis on us feeling like we need to parachute somebody into their life and and do that, but I, I found it interesting. I, even in 2011, Mentor did a survey of programs. Uh, it was before my time at Mentor, so I don't know much about that that survey, but even then it was like 80% of programs said that providing a caring adult relationship was their primary objective. So I just found it interesting that in this case, um, we found a, a lower percentage. And I think any of us that have been in this field for a long time um, have noticed the shift towards intentionality of outcomes. We're trying to improve grades. We're trying to get young people career and college ready. We're you know, helping them address serious needs, mental health challenges, et cetera. Uh, and so I think as this field has grown, it's got more intentional. And, and to that point, Sam and I did find that half of all programs are using a curriculum to guide mentor-mentee interactions. So they're being much more prescriptive about what that match does when they're together. Now, there could be downsides to that. Um, there's certainly a big philosophical debate to be had about whether you should be stuffing matches with uh, a bunch of activities that may inhibit the relationship. But uh, I thought it was pretty striking that half of programs used something to really kind of say when you meet this week you're going to be doing x and um, i don't think that was the case in this field 10 or 15 years ago um, as i mentioned earlier we've got some other comparisons in the final report that I, i'm not going to talk about here in the interest of time but the information's in there if you if you have it uh, and you know at the very end of this chapter there is a little sidebar that compares uh, urban and rural programs, and I was a little surprised to find that in many instances those rural programs compare pretty well to 
uh, what their counterparts in the, the cities are doing. Um, and so certainly rural programs face some challenges uh, in navigating geographic distance and all that, but in some ways um, they were creating matches that when they worked, really worked and lasted a little bit longer and, and had some other differences. So I encourage folks to, to look at that. So that was a whole bunch of information about the first two chapters of the report. I'm going to pause here and turn it over to Jen Burgoyne. And Jen, I, we've probably got some questions coming in. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. we can take about five minutes to, to answer some of those. Sure. Yeah, we've got a, a couple great questions coming in. Um, someone asked, when you were discussing programs that reported using the EEP, someone said, do we have any evidence that the relationship between using the EEP and the impacts you mentioned is actually causal and not merely correlation? Uh, for the most part, what we are reporting on here are correlations. Um, Sam and I, for the most part, did not um, do deeper statistical work to try and get at that. So, yes, I, if I inferred such, um, I probably shouldn't have. Um, we were noticing a trend, right, and a correlational trend. Um, we were not really um, testing that to see is, is, you know, using the elements in your work the thing that is making you different. Um, Sam, is there anything you want to add? kind of methodology wise there, you and I talked about this quite a bit around, you know, we weren't going to do that next level of stats work on this. Right. Well, I think the big picture is that this is a cross-sectional study. So uh, any type of causal inference uh, is really speculative, um, regardless of which statistics you use. I think that um, Janice Cooper-Schmidt has done some work that probably uh, more closely approximates uh, elements of effective practice and uh, some match characteristics, but the questioner was right on point that this is, uh, you know, not inferential in terms of making causal inferences, but it's uh, descriptive. And I think that, you know, presumably <laughs> we can uh, think that there's some probably uh, common factor that's driving the quality of these programs and fact they go out and get the elements of effective practice and they have high quality standards it's a really great question also a great research question yep yeah and I'm glad you mentioned Janice's study because she is one of the co-authors of the elements and has been doing some work kind of looking at the degree to which programs kind of follow those benchmarks in the elements and then seeing does that impact kind of the quality and length of mentoring relationships in fact she just put out a, a paper on this uh, a few months ago that said overall the elements do seem to uh, lend themselves <coughs> excuse me to assume improved uh, program outcomes but it was really the training standard and the benchmarks within that that were driving most of um, that difference so it's not that the others don't matter but if you really want to think like what's the mechanism in the elements that leads to better relationships and longer relationships it's often that training and the intentionality around preparing people to actually do the work of mentoring, which, you know, is is a common sense idea. But um, Jana's, I think, has, has got some good proof that that's true. And, and mentors are also doing some things. We're working with Dr. Tom Keller to do a, a similar study looking at how programs are applying those elements to their work. And then, you know, what is that resulting in for participants? And we've got some early hints that, um, mentor satisfaction seems to, you know, go up when you're when you're doing more of those practices um, in your program. So, more to come on that in in the years ahead. Great, thank you. Another question here is about the survey itself. How did you frame questions related to evidence-based best practices without making anyone feel like they were being judged or like they may want to alter answers to look better? That's a great question. Um, I think, once again, uh, we were using kind of previous efforts around this to guide what we asked, and it was kind of important for me to be able to do some level of historical comparison going back and, and comparing, say, to that early public-private venture stuff, or there was a report done in the mid-2000s from the Corporation for National Service that kind of looked at who's volunteering in programs. I really wanted to be able to compare historically. So I think um, 
that was the main impetus into how we asked certain things. Um, and we kind of put a range in there, right? And, and I'm sure there are some folks that probably looked at a question and said, well, you know, on average, we may not do it at this, but on paper, <laughs> we say we do three hours of training. In reality, we probably don't always hit that. And some of that was kind of unavoidable. In general, we asked programs to report on kind of what their reality was, not their, you know, their policy, their procedure. Um, but in some cases, that was, you know, we would ask them how long are matches required to meet or how frequently are they required. That probably speaks to a policy more than their actual on the ground reality and how that plays out. So in some cases, folks probably overinflated um, for that reason. They may have also overinflated because as the question asked, it's, you know, I feel bad because I know I'm not doing it at a good enough level, so I'm going to fib a little bit. But uh, I, I like to think that program folks are pretty honest here. We were very clear that no programs would be identified in any of the reporting that came out of this, even at the the state level, I was pretty adamant to all of our affiliates, like you will not be using this data to call out people. Um, so I hope that that resulted in in some you know answers that were honest and, and true, but um, it is always a, an issue when doing a survey like this. Awesome, do we have Again, time for one more? Yeah, we got time. No, we got time for one more. Okay. Someone asked whether your team determined how many mentoring programs surveyed were part of a national organization versus more independent local programs, and if you noted any differences in match duration or EEP usage between those groups. Good question, and I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, Sam, but I don't think we ever went back and coded who is from a national organization versus who's truly just a one-off grassroots program. Um, I've thought about that. We're going to talk a little bit about who filled this out in the next section here, um, but that's a great question and I think one that we did not explore very much um, in this report. Um, Sam and I have often talked, we could probably be pulling stuff out of this data set for another decade. <laughs> That's probably one of those questions that I now regret not exploring in this report. Um, but, you know, if I had to guess, I would say that maybe half of the folks that filled this out are affiliated with some kind of national or large regional provider. I mean, we had a lot of big brothers, big sisters agencies a lot of boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, 4-H, um, you know, a lot of our, our big national organizations have, have good representation in this. But I think in the next section, and that's actually, Jen, probably a good segue to move on here, is I think in the next section we'll see some of those differences. And I, I think one of my big takeaways from this survey was that this field remains incredibly grassroots and incredibly driven by local people that want to do good and make a difference and often without a lot of um, money or resources at their disposal. So to that point, let's look at staffing and funding of programs. Um, and good questions, everybody. Please keep them, them coming in. And if there are any that we don't get a chance to address verbally here on the webinar, um, I can take some time to write people back and, and follow the folks afterwards. So we spend a lot of time looking at the staffing of mentoring programs. And I think I personally was shocked to find that almost 60% of programs have fewer than three FTE running the program. Um, I would assume that there were more larger programs out there. Now maybe, you know, to Sam's point he just made about, you know, the validity here, maybe those larger agencies just didn't fill this out. Uh, maybe we this was something that appealed more to smaller programs, but I was pretty surprised to see that, uh, you know, most programs are just a one or two person show. Um, we looked uh, kind of at the, the paid staff to youth ratio um, across all programs, and it was about 70 youth served for every one FTE. Um, there was some work by public-private ventures in the early 2000s that found a ratio that was a little bit less than that. I think theirs was like 1 to 61 or something like that. So 
programs are serving a few more kids uh, than they were with the same amount of staff. Um, the average program had about seven and a half staff members, um, but they were much more reliant on volunteer staff than before. Um, I was really surprised at the number of programs that said they were purely volunteer run or that had, you know, half of their staffing, you know, uh, were, were volunteers. Um, you know, we were very careful in how we asked that question too, not to include volunteer mentors in that number. This was volunteers helping to run the program. Um, if you look across all the programs, it was about 100 uh, youth per, per staff, uh, and that's both paid and unpaid. Um, but there were some very, very, very large agencies that filled out this survey. And, and then throughout this section, I think Sam and I noted the impact that they had on this data and, and our attempts to average things. Um, a lot of very large agencies, usually from those national organizations, that were serving just a ton of young people with very few staff and, and with a lot of money. So. Um, those agencies probably have efficiencies that they've built into how they serve that many youth with the funding they've got, but um, it certainly skewed some of these these numbers here. I think the good news for me around staffing was that most programs, and it was like you know 80% or something, said our staffing is either growing in the last few years or has remained stable. So, and that was also true of their funding. Um, so I was really heartened to see that most programs are at least holding steady with their funding and their staffing. Um, some folks said that they're kind of fluctuating up and down, but really very few programs reported that either their budget or their staffing was shrinking, um, which is good because I think we kind of showed here that um, the, the need is only growing. Um, more youth and families are coming to, to our programs wanting wanting the support of a mentor. We also spent a lot of time looking at uh, the funding <clears throat> of programs, and it was very important to Sam and I to tell an accurate story here. Um, if you just divide like the total budget of all the programs that reported, you know, what's your budget? Um, and I should note here that for most of these estimates, Sam and I worked from the midpoint of the ranges that you see in this slide. So, um, that seemed to be about the best way to approach that statistically. It's not perfect. You'll also note that we asked, you know, more than a million was the upper limit in terms of a budget. So if you had a budget of five million, four million of that is really not accounted for in our our analyses here. So once again, caveats around uh, some of the completeness of this, but. If you look across all those programs, you'll see an average budget of about $150,000 a year, which seems like a lot. But when you look a little bit more granularly, this is a good example of some of those <clears throat> very well-funded large agencies skewing these numbers. We found that half of the programs in this sample uh, had an annual budget of below $50,000. Uh, which once again probably explains why they're just a one or two person operation and probably are reliant on volunteer help to deliver the services. Uh, a full two thirds are below $100,000. <clears> and it was really only 9% of our respondents had a budget over half a million dollars a year. So um, this was a really good reminder to me, especially working at, at Mentor National, where I mostly interact with you know, well-funded national partners and you come to our summit and it's in this nice hotel and, you know, you kind of lose that perspective sometimes, or at least I felt like I have at various points in my career. And remembering that a lot of this work is just being done on small grants, small donations um, with limited staffing um, and really, you know, trying to make do with, with what communities have in terms of resources. So, um, Sam, is there anything you wanted to add here about the uh, the funding numbers? Yeah, it, it, one, of, one of the things, Mike, that you and I have talked about a lot is that, uh, you know, I, I hope that these, the kind of average, the central tendency of this is not used in any type of, you know, policy or decision making because it's, it does not represent uh, what most programs are dealing with. And I think that uh, if you were to, you know, bet on you know pick out programs and how much their budget is like if you're playing roulette 
uh, and you put your you know roulette chip on 150,000, you would lose repeatedly because uh, it looks like the by far the most common uh, budget is less than 10,000. And I think if you look at, I think cumulatively there's something like 220 million dollars accounted for with programs in the survey, and you know well over half of that is accounted for by less than 9% of the programs. So there's a, a tremendous amount of money at the top, you know, the very small amount of programs, but towards the bottom, it's a lot of these uh, programs with really small budgets, uh, like you said, that are grassroots, mom and pop shop type of uh, programs. So I think that here the caveat is the central tendency shouldn't be where you focus, it should be the variance that these programs stretch all the way from less than ten thousand uh, dollars all the way up to over a million yep. so and i will also you know note that um one of the things we looked at here was also kind of who's providing that funding um but when we talked about funding we did not include in-kind things so we're we're not including in this um, donated building space and things like that. It was, you know, pure cash to do the work kind of way of looking at budgets and funding. Um, so we did find that the average program has only got about four or so sources of revenue. Um, and you can kind of see the breakdown of where that overall money kind of breaks out for our field. Um, but one of the things we looked at was kind of who is really dependent on one source of funding. What we found was 35% of all programs were what we wound up calling existentially dependent on one source of funding, the most common of which uh, were government agencies, either federal grants, state grants, uh, sometimes at a, a county or municipal level. Uh, and so that's concerning to me uh, to have a, a good third of the field really dependent on on one funding source and so i think diversification of funding is is something that we need to continue to teach programs to do and and certainly when we're encouraging investors to to get involved with mentoring um you know rather than starting up something new that's once again solely dependent on one person funding it um perhaps strengthening programs that already exist with new sources of funding um, we also looked at one of the most common questions I've ever been asked in my 20 years in mentoring. What does it cost to serve a mentee for a year? And Sam and I went through a lot of calculations and decisions on how we were going to calculate this. But we basically came up with a way of, of determining for every program that filled out the survey, what were they spending per young person served? Um, and there was a high end and a low end of those ranges, right? But if we took the midpoint of those um, and, and wound up dividing it by, by the kids serve, we wind up with the number you see here, almost $1,700. If you adjust the number that public-private ventures came up with almost 20 years ago as cost per match, this number is within 50 bucks of it. So over almost two decades, the cost per youth served is adjusted for inflation hasn't really changed and that that really surprised me um and you know because i would figure as our field has got more intentional is working with youth with perhaps higher needs um that there would be you know that that number would have grown as sam noted earlier there were a lot of programs that do a lot of work just through sweat equity rather than robust funding uh, that are dragging this number down we also looked at, at, you know, if you are serving youth that have more needs and perhaps more more risks in their life, uh, does that influence this? And we sure enough found that. Now, this trend is not consistent for every category of young person, but we did ask about a number of characteristics of the youth serve, what percentage of your youth are in foster care or have left school early or come from a low-income community and so on. There's there's more of these in the report than you see here, but what you clearly notice is for any one of these categories, kind of an upward trend that as the percentage of young people in your program that fall into that category goes up, so does the amount of money you're spending per youth served. And that trend is not perfect. If you look here at say foster care, 
or juvenile justice involved youth at the, the left end of the chart here, you notice that it dips down for that highest category. And that's, you know, the yellow is basically almost all of our youth are in this category. My guess as to what's happening with that is that those are programs that are residential. And so if I'm doing mentoring in a juvenile correctional facility, we ask them, we ask programs to say, what does the mentoring budget look like? We did not ask for kind of all the services. So if I'm working with youth that are juvenile justice involved, but it's in a community setting, my costs I think are going up as I work with more of those young people. They need more intensive work from our mentors and staff. I think that cost probably drops because those young people are in a facility where the mentoring they're getting may be fairly inexpensive, but they're getting a whole bunch of other things that are very expensive <laughs> that are not counted here. Same with youth in the foster care system. Uh, you see it in the runaway and homeless category. So that's that's my best guess as to what that dip actually represents. But I think this is encouraging and I think it's a good message for funders that if I'm a program that's working with youth that are bringing a lot of need to the table and need a more intensive form of support through mentoring, um, that that's gonna cost more than just perhaps that national average. And lastly, Sam and I really wanted to look at, do we get what we pay for in mentoring? So we did find that as programs do more pre and post match training, as they expect mentors to meet more frequently, as they check in with matches more, that costs more money. And, you know, Sam and I always joke, well, we just proved that more work costs more money, which, you know, duh, we know that. But I think one of the things that we then also looked at was, um, does that result in matches that persist? Once again, going back to that percentage of young people whose match met that minimum intended duration. As the percentage of matches that meet that benchmark go up, so does the average cost per youth serve. So to me, this is one of the best things in this report and one of the things that I'm most eager to share with funders and, and other stakeholders, which is if, if you want to have a program in which young people are getting the mentoring experience they truly deserve, that's going to cost some, some money. And, and to do this work right, you can't hardly do it on the cheap, I don't think. And so, um, you know, to me, this is encouraging. And I think this is an important point for us to make when, when we're going out talking with, with funders and other stakeholders about what it really takes to do the work right. So I'm going to quickly move through youth and mentors here. And this is described in a lot more detail in the report. Um, we did look at the demographics of mentees and mentors, uh, found that about three quarters of the nation's mentees are youth of color, uh, which surprised me a little bit in terms of that percentage. Um, and in some states, you know, it was, it was much higher. There were a couple of states where 80 plus percent of mentees were, were African American youth, and it was incredibly directed at one group of young people. Um, kind of in ways that, you know, I, I kind of wondered about um, from state to state. Um, serving slightly more, more girls than boys um, certainly uh, is a trend that's been true, I think, in our field for a while. Ages, this was the table that was left out of the first version of the PDF that we posted to the mentor site. But, you know, we found a pretty even split between what is essentially elementary middle and uh, high school ages. I know that there are more programs out there working with that 19 to 24 uh, category um, that filled this out, but I, I think that may be a function of our outreach and who our mentoring of mentor affiliates tend to work with. They tend to work with programs that are serving school age youth. So I know that those of you working more in the opportunity youth space or in that transition to college and career space, um, you're probably underrepresented a little bit in this data. We also looked at youth subgroups quite a bit just to try and get a handle on how many youth fall into a particular category. Um, and there were a lot of different ways that we calculated this. And certainly we looked at many more youth subgroups than this. There's a list of about 15 of them in the, the full report. And I want to explain this a little bit just so that folks can wrap their head around it. Um, 
programs were fairly inconsistent in how they reported this. So what Sam and I decided to do was to report it a couple of different ways. The column on the far right is when a program said, yes, we serve 100 kids and 10 of them are academically at risk. Well, then we you know, were able to, to you know, calculate how many uh, youth that were at risk were being served by that program. If you add all of those up and divide it by the total number of youth that programs reported serving, that's what the far right column is. Now that is probably a conservative estimate and probably on the low end. Um, because not every program reported whether they serve academically at risk youth or not. If you limit it to only the programs that said we serve academically at risk youth, then you get the middle column. So those are programs that said, yes, we definitely serve, for example, youth with mental health needs. We know that they're in our program and here's my guess as to the percentage of them. If you look only at those programs, about 20% of mentees have mental health needs. If you look at that in terms of the overall population of youth, it drops down to about 6%. So the column on the far right is the most conservative way of thinking about it. Uh, the column in the middle here is, is the one that I would use if I wanted to say out of programs that do focus on serving some of these youth, or at least know they do, um, what percentage of, of mentees across those programs uh, look like this. So this was something that Sam and I wrestled with a lot and ultimately decided to report it in multiple ways just to avoid um, people misusing those statistics. Right. I think just one other thing about that is that if I were to, you know, use that spread of data, you know, you get a different estimate with a different denominator, which we would expect, but I think if you're trying to be least wrong, uh, and this is what Heather and I talked about when we actually created these, is that I would guess, and I could be wrong, but I don't think I am, uh, is that the least wrong estimate is the middle estimate, which is the uh, programs that, that specifically commented on it and actually provided an estimate. Because what we found is that participants that did not answer that question uh, usually did not answer other questions, so that it was not like random missing this. So probably yep. they just didn't complete that. Uh, but for the programs that did, we can be pretty comfortable that, hey, if they said that they serve 55% of this group, then uh, it's, it seems to be reasonable. Yep. We also looked at mentors um, and kind of not surprisingly, uh, they looked a little bit different, uh, both along ethnicity and race and, and in terms of gender. Uh, we still need to get more men uh, mentoring in our, our programs, but um, I was, whoops, I was a little bit heartened by uh, the percentage of mentors of color. Um, these numbers were a little bit higher in some cases than I thought they might be. Um, there's been some other work looking at U.S. Census data around who says they mentor that I think I even saw one estimate that was like mid 80% of mentors are, are identified as white. That seems too high to me based on what I know about programs. So uh, this seems perhaps a little bit more like the field that I think I see when I, I go out and meet with programs. Um, we got some good information about who's stepping up to mentor. Um, those of you that work with corporate partners or, and really recruit heavily from businesses, keep doing it because I think it's working. Um, a lot of young professionals, a lot of employees of, of corporate partners. And then we found this great statistic, and I don't know if it's true, true or not, but uh, programs reported that about 8% of their mentors were former mentees in that program. And some of that might just be cross-age peer mentoring programs where you naturally progress from mentee to mentor, but I hope that's also a reflection that programs are retaining more of their participants over time through alumni networks and and other t opportunities to keep engaged um, after being in the, the program. Um, I think that's a wonderful way of, of getting that next generation of mentors. We also looked at, at training, and I'm not going to bother, you know, explaining this much other than, you know, most training uh, looks about how you'd expect a couple of hours, maybe up to four hours pre-match a little bit less post-match. Um, I did see a big spike here in the amount of programs doing more than four hours post-match, which I, I think is good. 
Um, match support. Uh, once again, programs are checking in about monthly, maybe a couple of times a month, and this was pretty consistent across most program models. So, I'm going to quickly mention a few main conclusions uh, from this, and then I want to make sure we have a few minutes here for a couple of questions. I think we learned that the demand for mentoring is growing. Programs are serving more young people uh, with kind of limited dollars and doing it with more volunteer help. Um, I think that cost per youth has not really kept pace with that, what I see as a shift to more intensive forms of support for youth that perhaps bring bigger needs to the table um, in a mentoring program. And I think we learned that programs really struggle to tell their, their story with rigorous evaluation. And I think that's something we're going to work on uh, for the field in the, the years to come. I'm going to skip over the limitations of the report just because I feel like Sam and I have talked about these quite a bit throughout uh, the slides here. Um, but just a, another caution to, to know that what we were not doing here was looking for statistical proof, but more just focused on trends and uh, tendencies um, and, and felt like that was, was a good starting point for this first report coming out of this data set. And then pass forward, um, you know, I, I think the one that I will really note here is um, investing more in evaluation of programs and encouraging funders to do so. If you're going to fund a program to do work with young people, we might as well evaluate it and see if we can't make that better over time. Um, and then the last one here is a topic that I think Mentor has been thinking about a lot over the last year or so, which is to borrow a phrase from, from Tori Wieston, uh, who's the developer of, of what's known as critical mentoring, are our programs teaching young people to thrive in perhaps toxic environments, or are our mentoring programs helping clean the air and, and purify the water, so to speak, and is all of our mentoring of young people um, really addressing some of these challenges uh, in the communities face uh, proactively and perhaps um, changing the way America looks um, one relationship at a time. And um, we didn't ask questions about that in this report, but frankly, it's something that I think in future surveys we'll be asking programs more about, like how their work winds up impacting their community, not just the individual participants. So uh, we are at a quarter past the hour, in fact, a little past that. So I'm going to stop there with the main presentation if folks have to jump off. Uh, we certainly understand, but I, I do want to allow for just a couple of questions here, Jennifer, if we've got a couple mm -hmm. of good ones. Yeah, we've got some great ones. Um, we've gotten a few questions about that statistic that only 44% of programs focus on the caring adult relationship component. People seem pretty surprised at that number. One person was wondering why you think this number is lower than in the past, and another person asked um, how this change in focus may impact youth outcomes? Tricky one. Yeah, well, I mean, I did talk about that a little bit. I was also surprised by that. Um, I think some of it could have just been the way the question was asked. That was included with this kind of laundry list of other outcomes, and those were things like, you know, improved grades and attendance and, um, you know, going to college and um, entering the workforce with, you know, skill. I, you know, I don't have the list in front of me, but it was included on a list that was with some things that were very much like distal end goals for kid outcomes, like hard outcomes, things that you would, would really measure. And so some of it could have just been people saying, well, you know, I don't think of this relationship as an outcome in and of itself. It's just what we do. It leads to these harder outcomes. But I do think, and this is just my personal opinion, that I have seen quite a shift in mentoring over the years from being something that was just designed to bring a caring adult into the life of a child who was lonely, uh, who perhaps just needed somebody to kind of pick them up a little bit, when I first got into mentoring 20 years ago, it often wasn't, it was unspoken that that would lead to other things for the child, but it wasn't promised. And what I have seen over the years, and some of this is driven by, by funders, and some of this is just driven by 
mentoring, I think, growing up a little bit as an intervention. I think programs have gotten a lot more intentional about asking their mentors to try and achieve a specific outcome for a young person. In fact, it's almost hard to find a program today that doesn't ask mentors to drill down on something in their work with a young person. Um, Sam, you run a program that's incredibly intentional about what it tries to do for young people. Um, so I think some of that is just the natural progression of our field. I think the danger in that and the thing that in a, you know, I talked to David Dubois in a conversation about this finding a while back and he said, you know, one of the things we don't know is whether that shift to more intentional and and kind of adult goals in these relationships, if you think of those outcomes as something that the adult wants, not necessarily what the kid wants, is that, you know, to get there, if you have to stuff the relationship full of all kinds of set activities and use a curriculum that, you know, you're taking away some of that natural magic and you might wind up getting in the way of those two forming a deeper relationship. Um, Sam, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. I mean, you run a program that is very intentional about what it does for young people, but I know that you've also tried hard over the years to strike that relationship activity balance. And so I don't know if you want to jump in and say anything there. Right. I think that, one, it's a question that we could probably talk about for another couple of hours. Uh, and I yeah. think that, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a lot of research in this area uh, that needs to be done. Uh, that hasn't been. Uh, so I, you know, I, my program that I run is an intentionally brief program uh, that tries to cultivate a, a relationship that, you know, a close relationship, but that has an expected uh, end time. And I think that if the other people who are reporting on their programs have similar programs, and the way the question was asked in terms of priority, like what, what are your top priorities? I can see how some of them would answer uh, that way. I agree with you though, that it's kind of this interesting shift in the field that right now it, it's a pretty radical change, like you talked about. And I think that that change, uh, you know, is not 100% in line with what we found empirically. So I, I, I'm a little bit concerned in the sense that we see a pretty dramatic change without corresponding dramatic evidence uh, for the change. And I'm just as curious as others on why that's happening and the rationale for it. And I think that, you know, from my program's perspective, it, ours was just a very pragmatic solution to the fact that the context that our programs were providing, these relationships weren't lasting a, a terribly long time. And uh, we still had, you know, students and constituents that wanted outcomes from these type of programs. And Felt like we could do some good in the short term and then hope for the best for the long term. Uh, but again, these are you know open empirical questions. So we don't have a good answer. I wish we had a better one. <laughs> yep. So I know that we're over time. Jen, do you want to do one more question and then we'll wrap this up? Sure. This one will maybe be a little quicker response. Um, how frequent how frequently will this survey be conducted? Great question. Um, we're still figuring that out. I think I heard a lot of feedback from mentors, state level affiliates, that many of them had kind of stopped doing this annually. And certainly I don't, we're not going to be doing it annually. Um, but many of them had moved to doing it even like once or twice a decade because what they were finding is over time, and I think this bore itself out in, in the data we just went through in some ways that these programs weren't really changing a lot over time. <clears throat> it was kind of from year to year, it was the same programs working with roughly the same kids and doing the same types of things. And so, you know, it's a lot of uh, effort and resources to collect this kind of data and analyze it and all that. So um, I would say the mentor will probably wind up doing this maybe twice a decade in terms of like a full field scan like this. But I think what I'd like to do is on an annual basis, start doing more limited surveying, because this was a long survey. If you ran multiple programs and reported on multiple programs, it may have taken you an hour sometimes to fill out this survey, and that's probably too long. I probably will shrink it back a little bit next time. But what I would like to do annually or even more frequently is reach out to programs and say, hey, let me ask you five questions about your fundraising or five questions about if you do use a curriculum, what's in that curriculum, how how intently do matches have to follow it. I, I think 
I'm becoming a bigger fan of like shorter surveys that drill down more on questions of practice. I think there's a lot of potential there. And just to be honest, it's an easier lift for those of you that run programs that are very busy, that don't have time to be feeding mentor <laughs> all the data in the world about what you do. Um, you know, we will not do that annually. It'll probably be, you know, every five or so years that we'll do something like that. Um, but those shorter questions of practice around trying to drill down and, and understand one specific thing a little bit better, we'll probably do that every year moving forward. So um, we are a good 10 minutes over our time here. So I'll give everyone their, their day back here. I really appreciate everybody uh, joining Sam and Jennifer and I for this, this conversation today. Jen, if there are questions that we didn't get to, you can go ahead and send those to me and I'll do my best to email folks. But um, folks have my contact information here on the, the final slide and I'm always happy to answer any questions best that I can about the data set and, and what we found and, and future plans for doing work like this. So I hope everyone enjoys the, the full report and uh, that it, it adds some meaning and context to the work you're doing out there. So. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today and, and enjoy the rest of your week.